What's really striking to me is how different this past week's AEW Dynamite episode was in this sense. Is how two hours can represent seismic shifts. The first hour was trash. Just total hot garbage. Feels exactly like the type of crap that would be written, produced, and booked by a bunch of Meltzer cucks in their little cocoon of cucking that are match marks and all they care about them are the move sets and the flips and the kicks and the near falls. And it was trash. The second half was better. Not perfect, no. Maybe in part the second half looks so significantly better because the first half of the show was just hot garbage. But the second half of the show felt at least a little bit more like something you would expect a big league major wrestling promotion to put out there. And I feel like ultimately that kind of carried the day a little bit in terms of the viewership that Dynamite got this past week. I can't imagine it was based off of the first hour. It had to be based off of the strength of the second hour. Because when you look at the first hour, like Omega and Page versus Private Party, Maybe there's a slight reason for the match. Because you had a segment last week with Paige and Private Party. Talking about whether Paige was going to cover the drinks or not. And he's not going to do it. But ultimately this match just comes down to guys doing moves. There's no heat. Nobody to hate. Nobody to really choose. Nobody to really like. It's just more of that typical indie mark 50-50 booking where everybody's trying to get the crap in that devalues everybody involved and elevates no one. And then you have right after the match, after Omega and Paige win, Pac comes on the screen and gets way more heat just for attacking, realistically, a nobody backstage that happens to be Kenny Omega's friend. So all this bumping around you're doing all this time and the fans really don't care that much. Then Pac does one little thing and it resonates with the audience. You see how simple it can be sometimes? And then you got like Chris Statlander versus Rio. Once you found out Brandy Rhodes was going to be on commentary, you knew this segment was going to be trash and a train wreck, and it was every single bit of that. Help me understand why Rio was in a Fatal 4-Way match last week, somehow won, defying all logic and reason, yet was put through a table by Nyla Rose to then come back this week and now you've got Brandy and Kong and all of this crew coming after her, coming after Statlander, but Riho still retains. Why do they so stubbornly dig in on this girl when she's not getting over? People do not like her. This is not Japan. They do not care. You have not given reasons for people to care. And if she's not going to be around consistently, if she's not going to be on the show every week or at least every other week to work, perform, or try to get her over, then she should not be your women's champion, you idiots! And then, as you go through the big reveal of Luther, he's a deathmatch legend in Japan, we are not in Japan. Stop that crap. Because it's so bad when you make a revelation like that, two things happen. One, people look at him as like, that grand gangrel? Two, even the people that watch Japan, a lot of them are like, who the hell is that supposed to be? If you're going to do big reveals on people, then they either better be people we actually know, more importantly, new eyeballs, mainstream, casual eyeballs better know, or B, it better be somebody that looks interesting and compelling enough where that doesn't matter, and this was neither. When you talk about this women's division of AEW, so much of it is broken, so much of it is stupid. It is so bad that the Divas division of WWE several years back is better than this hot garbage. 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 At least I will say one good utilization of these split screen commercials they have is when Sammy Guevara brings out the note cards and he's telling girls to holler at him on his Instagram and stuff. Like, he's trying to say he's a Spanish god. This is something that somebody that has an overinflated opinion of themselves would do. Like, this works. This makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is doing this whole match just to basically set up a Dark Order segment. 
Like, look, what the hell is, is, is this all about? So now all of a sudden they're trying to recruit Christopher Daniels, who ultimately doesn't join, to then have their other members of SCU come out. Didn't the Bucks come out too? So you close the year off with this being your big angle, and in the past couple of weeks they're getting beat down. Does that make any sense whatsoever? In a short period of time, they're just getting beaten down. That's dumb. And that kind of sums up this first hour of the show. It was doo-doo. It was crap. It was disconjointed. It looked like you weren't trying to get anybody over. And the good news is if that was the mission, you accomplished it because you got absolutely nobody over. Cody, I beg of you, I plead with you, I implore of you. No matter how beautiful Brandy is and no matter how much shit might be good, if you know what I mean, you shouldn't crap where you eat if it's not helpful to your business. Do you get what I'm saying? This Brandy crap has to stop. It is dumb. It is not helping anybody. It is not getting anybody over. And you would think for somebody that's been in the business a few years now, she would have learned basic fundamentals like voice inflection. Like, it sounds scripted. It sounds hokey. It sounds like a crappy WWE scripted crap. You come to watch a different product because you don't want that crap. You don't want to sit there and come to this product and see the same crap. It was terrible. But at least it kind of turned around in the second hour. Because the second hour was significantly better. Now, in terms of the Nightmare Collection versus the Lucha Brothers... Cody is supposed to be one of your top guys. And, and for all intents and purposes, he is one of your top guys. He shouldn't just randomly appear. He should have some type of backstage stuff. He should have an interview, video package, promo, something. Not everybody is the same. And not everybody is just going to care about the matches. You have to be able to make stars if this thing is going to last in the long term. And you're not going to do that through moves and matches. You have to get people invested in the characters that then get them invested in the story. And Cody apparently has connected, for whatever reason, with the live audiences on a weekly basis then you must build upon that. You must grow that. Having them just randomly appear in a match with this brother against the Lucha Brothers is not getting the job done. Not to mention the fact that the most important thing for Cody coming out of last week's show was his answer to MJF. Are you going to do the things that he wants that he stipulated in order to get the match with him at the next pay-per-view at the end of February? That was significantly more important than the throwaway match. And instead, they didn't address it. They had Arn Anderson talk for him. Like, why is Arn Anderson there? What is the purpose here? Part of this was supposed to be Cody can go it alone and he doesn't need help, but yet he's getting help from a former mortal enemy of his dad. How sensical is this? It's not. And it's not helpful to him. If he's having to bring people like Arn Anderson in, to try and get him more over, then that in and of itself success to problem. Your spotlight and focus on Cody should be on Cody and making him a big deal. Diverting focus away from him to Arn Anderson is not getting the job done. It's not. It really helped, though, the next segment when MJF came out, because at least I know when he's coming out, I'm going to get a good segment. I know this. And the back and forth between him and DDP with Wardlow standing there looking all big and menacing really, really works. Like there's a natural, I'm the establishment. I'm what was. MJF is the young, aggressive upstart. I am what is and what the future will be. Like the natural dynamics here just really, really work. DDP, a kind of man of the people, you know, MJF kind of a one percenter type of approach and it really really works I don't know if it really works to have DDP just beating up the blade and the butcher when they were just attacking Cody a couple of weeks ago and then they got beat down like you have to learn how to better protect your talents 
And is serving them up to DDP really the best utilization for them? But nonetheless, the segment itself was still really, really good. I should be wanting to see MJF versus Cody at the pay-per-view. I've been more interested for weeks in seeing MJF versus Diamond Dallas Page. You see where this is kind of broken? The other thing I would point out here is you got to learn how to space out the segments better. Cody got challenged, yet MJF doesn't come out during his match. Or more importantly, the very next segment involved MJF, and Cody doesn't come out to address him or face him or do anything like that, or respond to it or react to it in any way, shape, or form. Doesn't come out to help DDP, doesn't do any of that crap. Like, we should be able to piece together a show and think these things out a little bit better. Like, maybe Cody's match should have opened the show and MJF's should have kicked off our two. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, nonetheless, the segment was really good. Lucha Express versus Best Friends. Let me make this as crystal clear as possible. When the Luchasaurus freaking makes his entrance, you don't go to commercial. You anti-dinosaur jerks at TNT. His ancestors were mostly wiped out 65 million years ago. Surely we would look back in history and find out eventually somehow that was man's fault too because that probably was. And yet, when his entrance happens, which should be an event, which should be something that helps make him a star, which is actually featuring him to a mainstream audience in a positive light, you cut away to split screen so we can't see it or hear how stupid he has to be. And then in the match, you have him facing off with Orange Cassidy. Like, you should be doing something to protect both of these characters. You should not have Lucha Express, specifically the Lucha Source, I should say, sitting there and selling crap that Orange Cassidy is doing. No! He's a six foot five dinosaur in a mask! He shouldn't be selling to Orange Cassidy. And that's not that hard. That was aggravating. But I got to see the Luchasaurus. So I will take it. And we closed out the night with Dean Ambrose's big decision. And the whole time you're sitting there waiting, you're like, eh, this is almost too easy. This is almost too sensible. This is going to be a swerve. But it was really well done. Like It was a really enjoyable segment. The way it built up, the way they kind of tried to suck you in, the way they did this. I thought this was really well written. I thought this was really well produced. I thought this was really well executed. This is exactly the type of closing segment to a show that you should have to hype up your future title match at the next pay-per-view featuring your champion and your clear-cut number one contender. Like, this is the type of thing that tries to get heat on the heel champ. This is the type of thing that gets your kind of babyface tweener number one contender over even more with the audience. Like, I love so much about that closing segment. Like, if there was one thing that I pointed to, if somebody asked me, why should I even watch AEW? It's not going to be the moves and the matches. It's not going to be Cody Rhodes out there with freaking Arn Anderson acting like a punk ass scared of MJF. It's either going to be MJF's promo or this whole segment between Dean Ambrose and Chris Jericho. Because I'm going to say it doesn't have all of these elements consistently in the show, but you get some of this. And this is how big league professional wrestling should be done. This is how you make people care. This is how you potentially make stars in the case of John Moxley. This is how you try to move the needle in 2020. Not random matches with a bunch of moves where everybody's trying to get the crap in and nobody gets over. So whereas I thought after hour one I was going to come on here and just totally destroy Dynamite. Because it was so bad. The second hour did enough to give me a little hope of saying, hey, they're not perfect. Well, maybe they're starting to figure some stuff out here. Just maybe. But they still got a lot of work to do. But, but this, that second hour gives me some reason for hope.